University of First Nation, which is about three and a half hours north of Toronto, along the beautiful shores of Georgian Bay. Um, I'm Beaver Clan, and um, I'm really happy to be with everybody here tonight, and very thankful for everybody who's joined us, for everybody also who's joined us online. We've had an amazing day, and I want to thank people for coming back, and I uh, want to thank all of our speakers who I'll be introducing shortly. I'd like to start by acknowledging our traditional territory that we're in right now, and um, that is of the Anishinaabek people, and also uh, the Haudenosaunee. Um, this area, this place that we call Toronto, has long been a central place for Indigenous people for tens of thousands of years because of its abundance of food and life and beauty. And um, at the time of contact, it was the Mississaugas of the New Credit that were here. And um, so I'd like to acknowledge them as um, as being um, the people of this land and to pay uh, that respect as well. Um, I'd like to uh, also acknowledge tonight, um, we dedicated um, this night's talk to um, two amazing warriors and leaders in our community. Um, the first, his name is Randy Kapuchesic, and um, he passed away on April 25th, 2012. He's of the Mokri Beck. And um, I have some words here that a friend gave to me uh, to read. He will always be known, remembered for his love of the people, the land, and all his relations. We remember, honor today, his international work at the United Nations and his work toward environmental rights and economic stability. Randy also led the initiative to construct the Mokribek Eco Lodge in his community, forever always remembered as the chief of all people. We give him honor and thanks to him. The other person we wanted to dedicate tonight to is John Hill Dack, also known as Splitting the Sky. He's a Haudenosaunee who was instrumental in the 1971 Attica prison revolt, Gustafson Lake, and also um, tried to make a citizen's arrest against George Bush. <laughs> I'd also like to take this time to thank our many organizers that contributed to this evening. I'd like to thank the Indigenous Sovereignty and Solidarity Network, um, the Indigenous Education Work here at U of T Network, and the Justina Barnicky Gallery based at Hart House here at U of T. Also to Idle Memorial Toronto, and um, all donations are going to be going towards Idle Memorial Toronto so that we can organize more events like this and more forums. And I'd like to introduce as well um, Muskrat Magazine that is hosting tonight. And um, it's a significant time in the world. There's a new cycle that's beginning. The earth is changing, as we all know, we are also responsible for changing it. It's a time for a consciousness shift. And Idle No More is inviting people on Turtle Island and beyond to be part and to contribute to that shift. So uh, for me as a publisher of Muskrat Magazine, um, I believe that Muskrat is also contributing to that shift. We're an online Indigenous arts and culture magazine that profiles artists and critical commentary, defenders of the land grounded in traditional ecological knowledge. And in case you guys are looking for the magazine, um, it's not out there, but I encourage everybody to pick up a postcard and to check it out, it's online. And I keep telling elders this and community members, it's online. They're, they're always asking, when am I gonna see this magazine? Um, so we are working towards that. We're building that up to eventually come out with a print publication. Um, but what I wanted to share a little bit about what inspired the magazine, and that is um, the teachings of Muskrat. 
And in case people aren't very familiar, Muskrat is a central figure in the Anishinaabe creation story. And um, as I have heard, the, the story is, it can take days long to tell, so I'm just gonna tell a little tiny little bit of it. Um, there was a flood, a great flood, and spy woman came down to rest on the back of a turtle. Um, but of course she needed land for life to, to be sustained. So um, all of the most powerful water animals um, came to her and offered to dive down um, to go and try to grab a piece of soil to bring back up to her. And of course the strongest ones like the loon and, and the beaver you know, dove down and they were all in, in their, their turns going down took a very, very, very long time um, before they came up again, but each one of them um, came up empty. And so it was the muskrat that said that he wanted to try. And everybody laughed, um, but he was determined. And so he dove down and everybody waited and waited and waited until there was no hope left. And then finally they noticed um, muskrat's limp body um, rise and float to the top of the water. And they all were so upset because they thought um, he too had failed. And so, but somebody noticed that his little paw was clutched tight and they pulled him to the surface of the turtle and opened his hand and he actually had the tiniest little um, grain of earth. And so Spy Woman took that grain and she danced with it and she danced on the turtle's back and the turtle grew and grew and grew. And so that's why we call this Turtle Island. And um, Muskrat teaches us to be humble. He teaches us to have courage and that no matter what or how small or insignificant um, we may perceive ourselves to be or others may perceive us to be, that we have the power to change the world. So tonight is about the spirit of the muskrat, changing and caring for the world and the land in a good way. So I'd like to introduce now um, our honored speakers who have traveled far to be here and um, that have a lot of experience and words to share with us tonight. We have Ellen Gabriel. She's, a well, she's well known to the public and was chosen by the people of the Longhouse and her community of Ganesatage to be the spokesperson during the 1990 Oka crisis to protect the pines from the expansion of a nine-hole golf course in Oka. For the past 23 years, she has been a human rights advocate for the collective and individual rights of Indigenous people and has worked diligently to sensitize the public, academics, policing authorities, politicians on the history, culture, and identity of Indigenous people. She has made numerous public presentations on Indigenous rights and history to post-secondary institutions, conferences, including presentations to parliamentary and Senate committees, as well as Quebec's National Assembly on Legislative Amendments affecting the rights of Indigenous people in Canada. She has been active at the international level, participating at the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, negotiations on the Nagoya Protocol of the Convention on Biodiversity and advocated for Indigenous languages and cultures at the UN Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous People. <laughs> I'd also like to welcome Naomi Klein, who is an award-winning journalist, syndicated columnist, and author of the New York Times and number one international bestseller, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. It was published worldwide in 2007. The Shock Doctrine is being published in, has been published in 30 languages and has over a million copies in print. It appeared on multiple best of year lists, including the New York Times Critics Pick of the Year. Rachel Maddow called The Shock Doctrine the only book of the last few years in American publishing this was, is a quote that I would describe as a mandatory must read, end of quote. Naomi Klein's first book, No Logo, Taking Aim at the Brand Bullies, was also an international bestseller and translated into over 25 languages with more than a million copies in print. And uh, 
Uh, we are definitely lucky to have Arthur Manuel come to the stage again. He spoke earlier this afternoon. He's a member of the Nisqually Indian Band of the Chiquetmec Nation in Kamloops, British Columbia. Mr. Manuel is a spokesperson for the Indigenous Network on Economies and Trade, a network of Indigenous organizations who are achieving recognition for Aboriginal title and treaty rights at the international level. Um, his bio is like really, really long, but um, he is um, a mentor, um, a leader, and also a co-founder of Defenders of the Land. Um, which is a very important organization. I re recommend each and every one of us to go to their website. And then we also, oh. <laughs> so we also have um, a special guest who will be Skyping in. Um, knock on wood that we have no uh, technical issues. Um, Tracy Bowell is Métis from the Plains Cree speaking community of Black St. Anne, Alberta. She's a mother to four girls. She has an BED and an LLB and currently lives in Montreal. She teaches Inuit youth under child protection and blogs in Atabakosisen. Sorry about that. She's uh, passionate about law, culture, and language. She tries to deconstruct harmful myths with the hope that there can be a reconstruct, restructuring and renewal of the relationship between Canadians and Indigenous people. So we look forward to seeing her um, join the conversation um, midway through tonight. <laughs> and um, last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce our moderator for this evening, who is uh, Carla Robinson. Carla is a Canadian broadcast journalist and television host. <laughs> Carla's goal as a storyteller has always been to enlighten, inspire, and bring the stories of Indigenous people to a diverse audience. Tapping into her years of experience working in the mainstream media, Carla is currently launching her own production company, Carla Robinson Media Productions. Mm -hmm. She is also the host of a new biography program called All Our Relations that will air this year on the Aboriginal People's Television Network. For 13 years, Carla was a national news anchor and television host for CBC News Network, formerly CBC News World. Most recently, Carla was an arts and entertainment correspondent for the CBC News Weekend and CBC TV Toronto. As a proud Heisla and help took woman, Carla strives to promote an authentic Indigenous voice to the widest possible audience. Jimmy Glitch and welcome. all for coming out and thank you all for joining us online around the world across the country um, we're going to get right into it because we want to hear a lot of our speakers uh, thoughts and um, the theme of today's symposium has been nation to nation now and tonight we are talking about building a new relationship and a relationship between equals from nation to nation implies the sovereignty of said nations. And so I am, before I get into that, Naomi has asked me to just let everybody know as well that she will have to be leaving at nine. And uh, well, we'll probably wrap up around that time anyways, but she has to leave at nine. She's got a baby to get home to. So my first question, is going to be to Ellen and Art, and uh, then my second, then my third question, will, or second question, will be to Naomi. And the first question is, what does sovereignty mean to you, and how do Indigenous people in Canada achieve it? A real easy love. <laughs> I think we have about our own <clears throat> 10 minutes max to, to answer that question. <laughs> but anyways, it is definitely uh, sovereignty, like as a word, an English word, I, I guess. And it's sometimes used by indigenous people to describe the 100% uh, I guess, relationship that indigenous people have with their territory and their land. 
and uh, different nations um, exercised it differently depending on where where they're from. Uh, some in terms of uh, families, you know, having certain areas within their broad traditional territory to be able to uh, uh, take uh, sustenance and, and exercise responsibility for their territories. And uh, they work collectively uh, with other families that were part of their common language and their common uh, culture. In, in doing these things. Um, when the Europe came, uh, they disrupted whatever the authority was that we exercised, whether you want to call it sovereignty or call it whatever else you want to call it. Uh, because I don't want to get a, in arguments about what the terminology, I just want more to think about the concept that's, that's behind what the word is trying to describe. But the thing is that uh, the uh, Federal and provincial government, like I said, uh, were created by the assertion of uh, British sovereignty over our territories. That's what they created the uh, federal government and the provincial governments. And sovereignty in, in, the, in the, I guess the Canadian term, terminology means uh, the crown. It means that the crown represents the collective uh, proprietary interest of the uh, Canadian or the provincial, like in BC, they say British Columbians to uh, do that. And they've been exercising uh, maybe basically 100% jurisdiction between them over our land and territory. And that's the struggle between our people and the in the uh, government and we've used a lot of times the court uh, but we never ever asked the court about our sovereignty. I know um, when the Del Omo case was originally being argued they did have the question of sovereignty in there but from the Court of Appeal of the Supreme Court they dropped it as one of the causes of action and they instead just included Aboriginal title, which is a proprietary right, but it doesn't address the issue of sovereignty. So sovereignty itself has never been, that terminology has never been really argued before the, uh, the, the courts in this country between Indigenous sovereignty and sort of Crown, I guess, sovereignty. I know uh, in the Mabo case in, in Australia that uh, the issue of sovereignty was put before them and the court there said that they couldn't address the issue because the court itself was based on the sovereignty of the crown and that they couldn't uh, make a ruling that if the, I guess if the Australian people wanted to raise it, they'd have to raise it at an international level. But I think one thing is clear that we do have a very clear uh, sovereign or higher or legal relationship with, with our land. Um, that's what the um, Royal Proclamation of 1763, uh, they admit that because they say that in order for settlers to come on our land, they have to have an agreement with the indigenous people and then they put in this whole colonial doctrine of discovery relationship in there. But, one thing, though, is that that agreement definitely proves that, that we are a separate people. That's what the treaties also prove, is that we are a separate people. And in that sense, we don't need to be arguing about whether we're uh, Canadians on the same basis as settlers who came, you know, individually to North America, uh, to Canada. And, and became Canadian citizens and, and become subsumed under, I guess, what you call British or Canadian uh, sovereign interests. So the thing is that those are, I think, important things to sort of think about in terms of a framework of thinking uh, about this issue. But the real, I guess, heart and soul of sovereignty is indigenous people themselves, you know, 
like Wes said earlier, uh, but other panelists, you know, of getting out on the land, you know, of actually exercising your right and your relationship, your responsibility uh, to take care of your land and to stand strong on, on those principles uh, because uh, that's what ultimately will measure in the final analysis whether or not you will be a, a part of a whole new uh, Canada. Because for one thing, this is this issue about relationships. Uh, definitely when uh, the federal and provincial government of this country were forced into the position of recognizing and affirming our Aboriginal tree rights, these are proprietary and, and, and treaty like relationships with, country, with Canada. They recognize that sovereign relationship and they recognize that we are separate in terms of peoples who have a relationship with our, with our territories and they recognize that uh, we have a right to make our own laws, to govern our own selves in relationship to the land on which is ours and how that interacts with the, with the federal and provincial government is what should be uh, the substance of substantive negotiations and how we both can uh, live and coexist together, but not one dominating the other. So that's the, 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 the framework is there. That's what I'm trying to say is there's a, a constitutional framework that does exist that we fought hard to make sure is in place, you know, and that uh, sovereignty is one of those things that uh, we need to uh, strive in a political sense, I suppose, with Harper at this time to, to keep that issue on the table, uh, to make sure that uh, he understands that when we are speaking to him, we're speaking because we have a historical, a constitutional, legal uh, background in relationship to our territories. And it isn't based on the British North America Act. It's based upon the fact that we were here before the British North America Act. And that the British North America Act as the Constitution of Canada uh, was in violation of our right as Indigenous people uh, to self-determination. Going back again to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, to be able to put that as, as the foundation in our right as Indigenous people to uh, benefit and to make decisions with regard to access to our traditional territories. Those are some fundamental decisions that are part of that whole question of sovereignty, is access and benefits to our territories. And we need to be able to stand up to the federal and the provincial regimes that are saying that they have 100% power and authority to do that. And we need to be able to carve out a new kind of relationship within that dy dynamic relationship between Canada and Indigenous people. And that's what I mean by a, a new kind of Canada, because up to now, we've been living in this outdated, very antiquated colonial process that was imposed on us by Great Britain. And we need to, to break open, because that's what the whole question of, uh, of recognition and affirmation is all about. You know, we say we want the government to recognize and affirm our Aboriginal and tree rights. But we never really question, well, what does that really mean? And that's what this whole issue about discussion of sovereignty is really about, is it's throwing out that, that uh, big picture over all, both settlers and indigenous people, of what does that mean in terms of a, of a new Canada, not an old Canada. The old Canada 
100% of the power mutually and exclusively belong within the federal and provincial governments. No, that's, that's the old, antiquated, outdated Canada. There's a new Canada that includes Indigenous people in terms of recognition, in terms of affirmation of our Aboriginal title, rights, and our treaty rights. And that's a rebuilding of, of, of a new a new dynamic, a new human relationship that's really needed. There's 370 million Indigenous people around the world. Canada is one of the places where, you know, like there's only 37 million of us in this, on this in Canada. And it's large enough to, to come up with a solution. We do have the framework, we can do it. And sovereignty, Indigenous sovereignty, recognize that is really one of the critical issues. And for those of you just joining us, I'm going to repeat the question for Ellen. Um, what does sovereignty mean to you, and how do people, Indigenous people in Canada, achieve it? Thanks, uh, Sam, what one of these? Um, just to add what Art has already mentioned, I think sovereignty is really it's, it's not an adequate word for what Indigenous people really mean when we take, we're taking control of our own destiny. We're taking control over our own education, our cultural and socioeconomic rights. We're getting access to our lands and resources without being criminalized, without the state coming down upon our people for asserting what we see as our sovereignty. We have our own citizenship and within that definition of what is considered citizenship is, is not just having a bank card. It's what are you going to contribute back to your nation. It's really about all the people being on the same page. And when Europeans first came here, there was at least, at least one million, five million Mohawks. And the reason why we were able to use the kind of consensus building in order to make decisions is because we had that plan system. We had women's councils, we had men's councils, and together they made decisions in regards to what is going to happen for the people. How are we going to be planting? Who's going to do what? And it was that balance that was there, and I say was, because that balance is not there now. That balance was attacked. The family unit was, was ruptured by the Indian residential school system. And, and it's all been about a land grab. And so in order to restore what we see as our sovereignty, and in order to stop tyrants like Harper, because I don't think it's possible to have a relationship with a tyrant who doesn't listen, is that we need Canadians to understand that if we stand up to protect the environment. We are the first line of defense for your betterment and well-being and for your quality of life and to understand what customary laws talk about and that is our obligation. It's not just our right to sit here and to say, this is my land. We're sovereign and you know, pound our chests. It's really about what do you as an individual of your nation, a citizen of your nation, do to actually carry out your obligation as a citizen of your nation, as, as part of that obligation of our ancestral teachings. And so part of it is That's what sovereignty is about. That's what sovereignty is about, is speaking your language, too. That's a gift that nobody really talks about in regards to when we talk about our rights 
and the institutions that were attacked by colonialism. One of them was our languages. And, you know, like, and I'm going to keep going back to the white paper policy in Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Jean Chrétien. When you no longer speak your language and practice your customs, you have become assimilated. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of language in regards to the self-determining rights of indigenous peoples. Because self-determination means you understand who you are as a former person. You understand who your, what your obligations are as a human being. And speaking your language, which is really difficult from where I live in Quebec. Because in order to get a job, that is, that is really a good job outside of the community, you need to speak French. And so many people, like my parents' generations, we heard trilingual people, we had trilingual people. And sovereignty for, for me means, and if we're gonna get it back, and I mean if, if we have that opportunity, it means understanding the traditional knowledge that is embedded in those languages that teach us how to protect and, and to nourish the biodiversity that exists. That relationship is not just amongst human beings. It's amongst the environment that we live on and depend on. It's amongst, the, it's, it's amongst the, all our relations, taking care of those who cannot speak. It's understanding and approaching the ceremonies in your language. When we go pick medicines, we don't do it in English and French, I can tell you that. We do it in our languages. You cannot do your ceremonies in English or French, it's not the same. So, how do we achieve it? Well, let's get rid of the doctrine of, of discovery, which private property law and Canada's sovereignty is based upon. Let's get rid of the papal goals. Let's undo this this relationship that is based upon oppression, not upon an equal balance, not upon respect. The Turo Wampum talks about, you know, this is, these are two vessels traveling down a river. And in those vessels, a canoe, or whatever you want to call it, you know, a kayak if you want, is your laws, your languages, your customs, your values, your beliefs. And neither one was supposed to interfere. Well, the Turo Wampum has been disturbed and upset. And in order for us to regain that sense of who we are as human beings with a right to self-determination, we need to, to restore those institutions that have been damaged. We need to bring back our children who have been taken into the child welfare system because People did not know how to parent when they came back from the Indian residential school. We need to bring back the education and Indian control over Indian education, the battle cry of the 70s, means that we have apprenticeships in medicine, our traditional medicines. We have apprenticeships in learning the songs, in learning how to hunt, how to fish for the youth. That's what sovereignty is, it means a way of life. It's not an abstract form that we see in books and that researchers come in and pick their, our elders' brains and they claim it as their intellectual property. It's really about believing that we are part of creation. We are not separate from it. And that we need to become part and understand that. You know, we need to assimilate Canadians into the teachings that our ancestors Woo! brought us. Woo! Woo! assimilation than what we've experienced. Uh, so I guess I'll end for now because I don't have a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Okay, my next question is for Naomi. And uh, Naomi, how has like how has I will know more impacted you? And what motivated you to come in and join the conversation. Um, thank you, Carla. And I, I want to thank uh, the organizers, Muskrat Magazine, and I just want to say what an incredible honor it is to uh, be on this panel with two 
such amazing um, leaders, fierce leaders, um, and uh, I feel really humbled to be keeping such company. Um, Arthur's been one of my teachers in all of this, um, though any mistakes I make are my own. <laughs> but uh, I've, I've learned a huge amount from him over the years, and he's taken me to his territory. In terms of why I'm here, I have to say, you know, I'm here because I was honored to, to be asked, and, I, and I'm not sure I deserve to be here because, you know, I don't I don't consider myself an expert in this area. I feel I'm very much learning, um, and and uh, and and so I, I feel a little bit tentative in this role. Um, but the reason I wanted to be here is precisely because I've been so inspired by by the emergence of I don't know more so inspired so excited um, it I guess one of the things it felt like was just a huge relief um, that something so hopeful was emerging at such a scary time I think for Canada and for the world for the planet um, it, it almost was too good to believe um, and um, so you know I don't on a personal level, I want to, to to do what I can to 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 be part of this movement that has been a very welcoming movement. That's been a movement from the start that has said this is um, about uh, indigenous and non-indigenous people working together to, to build a new kind of relationship, a new kind of country. That said, the name of this um, forum is Nation to Nation, and I am not representing Canada here. <laughs> I think that would be a very poor negotiator. Oh, we, we could get this done really, really quickly. Um, I think that's up to me. Um, I would absolutely submit to Ellen's assimilation. Um, <laughs> Five years or so, which is around climate change, and really feeling the the urgency um, of us needing to have this paradigm shift, this new narrative, because the old narrative um, is a suicidal narrative, and the science is so clear now. And it's one of the things that's really interesting to watch is how scientists are becoming radicalized by their own findings because they're realizing that, uh, that, that sustaining life on Earth, sustaining a habitable planet, is not compatible with capitalism. It just isn't. It's not compatible with an economy built on Earth's scale. And it isn't just about, about, about climate change. I mean, in some sense, climate change is, is an indicator species for a broader crisis. It's, a, a, a broader uh, depletion that's happening on the planet, um, a broader maxing out of all the natural systems. Climate change is about the fact that we have overtaxed the atmosphere, but we've overtaxed the waters, and we've overtaxed the soil, and we've overtaxed all of these systems. Um, but yet, climate change puts us on this on this deadline, right? I mean, the, the, the science is so clear. And, and what it tells us is that we have till the end of the decade to actually get off fossil fuels, to really make this sort of new turn. We don't have to get off them completely by the end of the decade, but we have to make a really, really good start. So I think that's our context. And in Canada, we are climate criminals. Um, we have a problem. <laughs> you know, that it's not just that we're bad. We're the worst, right? We we I, I, we are going after the dirtiest source of energy that covers a territory the size of England. We have a government that wants to get it all. <laughs> that is an adjunct of the oil and gas industry, as, as we've already heard, and that brings, I think, a really sacred responsibility to all Canadians um, to understand that. 
that, that we, you know, we, we in some sense, you know, we hold the future in our hands. It's not just us, but we have a very special responsibility because we are at the forefront of this doubling down on extreme energy. You know, here we are, we are kept co confronted with this evidence, we have to get off fossil fuels. And what are we doing? We're going after the absolute dirtiest possible fossil fuels imaginable. Tar sands are the epitome of this because it takes you know, three times more carbon to produce a barrel than a, 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 a fossil of tar sands oil than it does conventional oil. But the same could be said of, of the risks that, that are carried by fracking because it takes so much water, uh, or mountaintop removal, coal mining. Like all of this is just, it's demanding so much more of, of us. Um, so, so, so we are at the forefront, and, 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 and First Nations people living downstream from the tar sands in Fort Chip have led this incredible movement, right? It's been going on now for many years, and the, the mainstream environmental movement has really just gotten on board in the past three years. Um, but there has been this amazing movement that I've been very honored to be a part of. So I feel like I have been part of this conversation, not in the context of I don't know more, but in the context of, I think, some of what has fed into this moment, which are these coalitions that have emerged, um, particularly around the pipelines. I, I've been living in, in BC for the past few years, that's where my family lives. Um, and the, the coalitions that emerged to fight Northern Gateway and now Kinder Morgan are some of the most beautiful political coalition that I've ever seen. Um, and the respect for First Nations sovereignty in BC, I think, and it, I would love to hear Arthur's perspective on this, but I think there has been a change in the recent years where the, the capacity of the government, of, of, of the provincial government and the federal government to pit Native and non-Native interests against each other in some sort of zero-sum game battle have really fallen away and more and more non-native Canadians have come to understand that First Nations sovereignty is, is, is a gift. It's the last line of defense, but it's, it's such a gift. And I guess my last point would just be, it's becoming more and more precious because of the broader economic context in which we are, are existing, which is the, the, the steamroller that is global capitalism, where Everybody is being homogenized into this one single system under one, one single set of laws. I mean, that's been the trend that we've been in um, in recent years, is extending rules beyond national borders, setting up the World Trade Organization, having free trade agreements, bringing everybody into this one regime. And what that means is that, you know, what Art was talking about, about separateness, that those spaces of separateness that have a legal grounding are, are so important because it gives, uh, it gives a place to fight from, right? Because I've been part of anti-corporate movements now for a long time, anti-capitalist movements, you know, in Seattle and all the rest of it, right? But the problem with these movements all, has always been their transience. They didn't have anywhere to stand, they were rootless. So the analysis was good, but they were too easy to uproot, right? They're almost, they're always like mirages, occupies the same, they're too easy to evict. So if you're trying to fight from within the system, and you're trying to fight from a position of rootlessness, you're never gonna win. <laughs> um, so that's why I feel like the coalitions that we're starting to articulate um, are so exciting and, and give me so much hope. Art, Art and Ellen, do you have any thoughts on what Naomi has just talked about before we go into the next question. Yeah, I think one of the things that's, that's very important is, <clears throat> I think indigenous people, and, and we heard it a bit in the, a number of the uh, panels before uh, about the, our vision of, of, of an economic system, a value system looks at the land, the plants, and the animals, and the trees, and the air, everything, as part of the um, decision-making in relationship to um, our territories. We don't just look at, you know, land as a natural resource or a, um, to produce products to 
defeat consumerism to make money and profit. Those are really two different uh, economic you know, regimes and value systems. And that's, I think, what is being talked about in terms of indigenous people are needed in terms of adding to the dialogue. And I know this puts a real dilemma on a lot of indigenous communities because I know the mining companies in my area are talking about, you know, contributing jobs and business opportunities and trying to get us to plug into this very corrupt, you know, economic system that looks at it as a resource as a pro and for profit as opposed to one that looks at, you know, what are we really gaining here? You know, we might have a mine open for 11 years and we might produce a few hundred jobs, but we're going to leave the mining tailings for our grandchildren and we're going to pollute the whole Fraser Basin uh, watershed. You know, those are issues that don't seem to be raised by this other debate. And this part is part of the environmental process and, the, you know, all this kind of stuff. There are some real fundamental debates for Indigenous people, but I think Indigenous people have to stick to protecting Mother Earth. That's the only real, you know, economic and political uh, argument that, that, that we can really contribute. So I really support that. Thank you.
to, to, to really change the way that we look at the earth and really change the way we look at how we live in a more humanitarian, kinder, and gentler way. And, and that's what I think this movement is, is going to bring, and hopefully bring, and then continue that momentum. question, I just want to add my two bits here. Um, I'm from the Haisla and Haltzuk First Nations. Uh, the Haisla territory is where the terminal is proposed to be. I can tell you that there are a lot of Haisla and a lot of Haltzuk people that are strongly opposed to having the Enbridge pipeline be built. We just got the Ulikin back after 10 years. The Ulikin came back to our territory and it's a miracle. <laughs> and I want my children to have a future in their territory. And I grew up in Kitimat in Northern BC with a boom, bust, boom, bust cycle where we, it was forestry, Uricam, Ocelot, Methanex, where we put all our hopes and dreams into the next industry that was going to carry us through. <laughs> the busts came, and we're thinking very short term, and the busts are going to come again. And even people in Kinemat are discovering that living in a boom cycle is not very good. It's dangerous for the women. It's, it brings in a whole bunch of strangers that are just, ah, uh, you know, they're just in there for temporary living and money which actually brings me to my next question. <laughs> uh, to, um, I guess first to uh, Ellen and Naomi, um, but also to R2, increased violence does seem to happen um, in extraction-oriented economies. Um, how do we build a relationship between Canada and Indigenous people that creates safety for women and children? <laughs> well, I, I think one of the key issues is education, education, education. And understanding that violence is not part of our culture. Violence is something that happens when, you know, minds get twisted. Violence is something that should not be acceptable anywhere. And the way we do that is, you know, parents, aunties, uncles, you role model, those kinds of, of personalities of, of being peaceful, of understanding how to use your mind and, and your heart to express and, and go through conflict. Um, we've seen, you know, sexual violence used as a weapon against nations, and indigenous peoples in the Americas were no exception. Uh, indigenous women were the least valued. Indigenous women were considered um, rapeable, they were expendable, and it's still like that today. So what changes is you need to have a national plan of action. A plan of action that includes police, that includes teaching curriculum into elementary, high school, includes teaching police how to deal with violence, and, and does not, it makes justice um, fair and equitable to everybody, not just because of your race. But I think it's really important to, to, to say as well that until, until we stop violence against all women and girls and boys, that violence will continue to be part of one of the, the sad things that we see happening in Canada today where Aboriginal women are the most marginalized group, experience, um, I think one in seven experiences some kind of violence at the hand of their partner. But also to change, as Amnesty International's report, Stolen Sisters said, is to change how society views Aboriginal women, Indigenous women, and, and 
to, to teach that racism is not acceptable, racism is part of the problem. But also, you know, we don't lay enough blame, I guess, for lack of a better term, on the entertainment culture that we see. And we forget about them, right? Because it's, it's nice to go to a movie and you see all this, and women are still the victims. You know, feminism, I was a little girl when feminism was happening and women were burning their bras and, and all these kinds of things. And today when you look at it, and I know the trend is changing, but young women think that if you call yourself a feminist, you're a man hater for some reason. You know, you must be a lesbian then if you call yourself a feminist. But women do not have equal pay with their, with their male counterparts. And it doesn't matter if you're indigenous or not. You see that in, in universities like McGill. You see that in, with CEOs. Um, but, but we have to change the culture that is in the globalized society that allows extractive industries to go into towns, whether it's only men, and then again, all these, these jobs creation that Harper announced in his budget, these are all job creations for men. They're not for women. So, so we need to remember that if there is a budget coming out, Trying to analyze what is what is for women and what is for men, but again, it, it's about education and, and educating for sure, not just police and judges who also need education, but politicians who are there and who make the decisions and, and getting the men involved in this issue. We need more men to stand up and and for their sisters because the violence comes a lot from men. Violence does come from women too, but if we're going to restore our places back in, as equals in decision-making processes and in the society, we also need the open-mindedness of our brothers to be there. They, they actually call them man camps. You know that in, in the extractive industries, where you have these these um, you know these temporary cities that emerge uh, in, a, in the back in oil fields and in the states, or you know in Fort McMurray, um, the gender ratios are completely out of whack. Yeah, they're called man camps, and you know um, Leanne Simpson is here, a wonderful writer and activist, and we had a conversation. I think I hope some of you read the conversation that we had. Um, in, in Yes Magazine, um, in the Ravel, it was published, but we talked a lot about um, extraction and this extractivist mindset. And I think we need to make connections between, um, you know, what is going on in these places, uh, like Fort McMurray or wherever the ex extractivist zone is, and what is the mindset of um, the, the lack of relationship. Leanne was saying extract extraction is a theft so it's rape, right? It's taking without permission, it's taking without consent, it's taking without any reciprocity, right? Um, so that's the way you're treating the land, and it's also the way you're treating bodies. Um, and what we know is that the fastest way to clear land is to use sexual violence. And I think you know, Canadians, more broadly speaking, understand that if you're talking about the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the role that mass rape plays in the Congo. It's to clear the, the, the land for mining. Um, you know, this has been tracked, and you can see this all over, all over the continent, all over Africa, where you have these spikes in rapes wherever you have a big you know, resource grab. Because you break the community, you add shame, um, and people don't defend the, the land in the same way. They scatter. It's much easier to get resources out when, once you've introduced sexual shame. Um, but, but that's not the story that we tell ourselves about the residential schools. We don't tell us, we, you know, we talk about that violence um, without talking about what that violence served and how it benefited Canada um, and, create, and helped create Canada's wealth. So I think that as, as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, you know, wraps up its work and we think about what kind of conversation that should start, I hope that that's a conversation that we can have is not just what happened, but why it happened. 
what it served. Um, because I think that would be very healing for this country. Um, and um, I mean, the only other thing I would just add is that there's a pretty amazing phenomenon happening worldwide with women rising up against rape in ways um, you know that you know I don't certainly I don't remember uh, in my lifetime you know happening you know the huge protests in India which is incredible um, and so I think there's something in the air <laughs> um, and and uh, and that needs you know I think it, it is here it is here as well but it needs to get stronger. You know, I think one thing as an uh, indigenous uh, male and, and talking about this very important uh, topic is, uh, is that there is a lot of uh, discrimination even in our communities as indigenous uh, men. Uh, I see that a lot in uh, just the, the treatment of uh, uh, women chiefs these be male chiefs, like we have a woman chief in our reserve elected chief, uh, Judy Wilson, and uh, you know, a lot of times, a lot of our issues in terms of raising the very same issues as males sometimes aren't really heard by the other male chiefs, you know, uh, and it proves that. But indigenous women are really the most discriminated uh, people uh, in, in Canada, there's no, there's no and ifs and buts about it uh, in terms of economic development, in terms of job opportunities, and in terms of programs and services. There's a tremendous amount of discrimination, and uh, and uh, I guess against Indigenous women, you know, and there is a lot of violence uh, there. I think keeping the pressure on, on the system really important and I, uh, I think things like they had an uh, inquiry about uh, a provincial inquiry about uh, the uh, murdered missing women in, in British Columbia and uh, the indigenous women asked to be um, supported in terms of having legal counsel so they could appear before the committee and question the the police and the uh, province uh, wouldn't uh, accommodate that, and uh, they couldn't, uh, therefore, couldn't really represent themselves. So they pulled out. And eventually, all the in in indigenous people wound up pulling out of that inquiry. Yet the inquiry went on. You know, this this kind of thing, and Canadians should be really embarrassed about the fact that it, it continued on without. Indigenous involvement and support. It's going to be just a big whitewash, you know. Support. <laughs> you know so there's real institutionalized aspects of it in, in, in this country. So I think it's a it's an issue that we need to keep raising. I know when I was uh, I'm also the um, one of the coordinators for the North American Indigenous Peoples uh, Caucus, and we just met in, in San Diego. And, and the whole issue about uh, uh, violence against women was one of the topics that they, they raised and said that we need to keep the pressuring at the international level. So I'd just like to say that. Thank you. We are going to go to Chelsea now. Chelsea Ball is going to come online, I believe. We're just calling her up. I bet you should be chomping at the bit to get into a lot of the discussion that we've been having. I think she's been tweeting us all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think she's uh, just trying to come. Uh -huh. And uh, while we're waiting, I just want to share with you two little stories, um, or two experiences. I was almost um, a missing and murdered Aboriginal woman twice in my life. Once, when I was going to Carleton University in Ottawa, a car full of young white men tried to abduct me, and uh, I stood up to them, and thankfully a taxi driver came and helped me. Another time, I was in Smithers working on a story, and uh, at night, 
it was actually a native man with a large group of people who wanted to take me from the hotel to a party and felt like he had the right to take me from the hotel. Thankfully, I was um, a table full of non-native truckers actually helped me out. <laughs> so it's not just the dispossessed women. It's not just uh, you know marginalized Aboriginal women who are being attacked. You know, it's it's a lot of our sisters, and something does need to be done. So. Uh, And is Chelsea there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, great, great. Um, to bring you into the conversation, um, your latest blog was on what is happening in Indian country with all the bands getting, um, being forced to sign agreements with non-derogation clauses. Uh, could you explain that a little bit better than I did? <laughs> Okay, first, um, just let me introduce myself, please. Uh, Tansi, I'm Chelsea Bao, I'm the Tansi 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 Bao, for me, the audio is really going in and out. I'm hoping that you can hear me. I'm just going to work my face here. <laughs> So the things that I was talking about recently on the blog came to my attention. Um, a reporter had found out that some bands were receiving um, some altered uh, contribution agreements. And these are annual agreements made with the federal government. They basically lay out the funding uh, for each band every year. And it's something that has to come around during the fiscal part of the year. And what was being discovered is that some of the, uh, the um, appendixes of these uh, agreements, I'm going to take this out so I can't hear myself here. Some of the appendixes of these agreements had some interesting causes in it. They were asking some bands to agree to omnibus legislation. They were um, doing clauses that are related to the C 27, which is the first piece of financial transparency. If she could just put it in again, Chelsea. Yeah, if you could just put it in again, because we can hear you a bit better. Okay. 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 All right. Um, that's better. Okay. One of the things that was missing that's really important is something called a non-derogation clause, and in legalese. Uh, basically what it means is that it protects Aboriginal rights from any sort of unintended side effects that agreements can make. Um, so when you make an agreement, say you decide on, on funding for um, any sort of activity that's going on. Uh, when you make that agreement, you're not saying this is how it's going to be forever. You're, you're saying this is how the funding is going to be now. Now if the agreement that is in place uh, in some way interferes with your Aboriginal rights, whether it's because it, uh, it sets limits on how many people can get licenses to, uh, to trap, for example. Okay? Because hunting is fairly unregulated in a lot of areas, but trapping is very heavily regulated. So say they say we're going to let you have 15 trapping licenses. The non-derogation clause in the agreement makes sure that that's not limiting your Aboriginal right to trap, that this is not something that's going to mess you up later. Now this clause has been missing from a lot of the contribution agreements. And people are actually going back to last year's agreement, noticing it wasn't there either. This is significant because um, what Wilton Littlechild has noticed that since 1995, these non-derogation clauses, which are strong protections of Aboriginal rights, have been slowly phased out in favor of sneakier language. Mm -hmm. And some of the sneakier language are things like quieting of titles. Quieting of titles is not extinguishment of rights. What it is, is it's saying that you have your Aboriginal rights, but you contractually agree never to exercise them, okay? There is a huge distinction in the law between those two things, but where you're on the ground, it's exactly the same thing, okay? So non-derogation clauses are meant to prevent any sort of uh, erosion of Aboriginal rights, and those clauses have been deliberately taken out from a lot of the contribution agreements, not all of them, 
They're in there somewhere uh, for some people. Some bands have uh, literally penned it in, said we're, we're writing this in and, and we're, this is what we're signing. Other bands haven't been successful at that. They've said, look, we want this back in and the federal government refuses to budge. And uh, if they don't sign this, they get no funds. The funds do not flow. As of April 1st, those bands will have no funds. And as of right now, there are at least three bands that I know of that have refused to sign, and there may be more. So this is an immediate problem because this is one side of a contractual agreement significantly altering the contract without bringing that, those changes to the attention of anyone. This was only noticed because some people sort of, with everything going on with Idle No More, wasn't, they weren't so trustworthy of the government. They took these things home and they read them and they said, wait, there's something strange going on here. Okay? I think it's really important that people be aware of this right now because the time limit is coming up. Okay? These funds need to flow very soon or some of these bands were very, very impoverished are not going to be able to make even the most basic payments um, to their people or get the funding that they need for um, structural programming. You, you know, when you need to build infrastructure, you have to get those loans ahead of time. You know, if the money dries up, so does your loan. <laughs> and so do all of those things that you have going on. Um, so other things that are being put into those agreements uh, seem to be really tailored to, to regions. Uh, some of them have to do with financial transparency. Some of them have to do with agreeing to different rate changes uh, according to provinces. Okay? And, and it all seems to be based on opening up these, uh, these areas for exploitation. Okay? Wherever there is a need to open up for resource development, you, that's where you're finding some of the biggest changes in these agreements. Um, and so far, I haven't heard anything from uh, the national chief uh, or any of the national leaders on this. This is something that is hitting us across the country right now. And so I just, I wanted to bring that up today. Thanks, Chelsea. <laughs> We're going to hear a bit about this from our panelists here too, starting with Ellen, your thoughts on what's happening. I mean, Canada, the federal government has been playing this game of uh, economic terrorism, extortion, um, uh, for many, many moons. Um, so it's no surprise, especially considering the China uh, trade agreement that Canada recently signed, and that it's so ridiculous uh, regarding the fact that if, um, you know, if anybody gets, stands in the way, China has a right to, to sue. So, so we have these bands who depend on their financial agreements. And the, the thing is, the money that comes to our communities, that's our money. That's our money from a trust fund that was created in the late 1800s, 1880, something like this, where Canada decided to take upon itself the fiduciary responsibility of handling those monies. And originally, a lot of our agreements came from um, uh, minerals and Resources Department within Canada. So now we see that Canada is, especially this government, is flaunting um, its disrespect to Indigenous people's rights, is flaunting the fact that it does not respect or recognize that the rule of law applies to them, and is using this kind of extortion on the communities who are already strapped. If we listen to and read what the former Auditor General Sheila Frazier wrote, you know, just for education alone, it would take at least, what, 26 years for community co schools to catch up with the kind of education that, that exists in the rest of Canadian schools. We look at what's going on in social services, uh, and, and we see what we have as our land base shrink every single year. Because while so-called land claims negotiations, and land claims, I, I totally disagree with that, go on, third-party interests can continue while land negotiations go on. And so this is no surprise. The, the problem is we need strong leaders to say no. We need the band counselors to really understand what it means to stand up for your rights and have the courage to do so. And it, as Chelsea mentioned, if they were all to, to unite together and say, this is ridiculous, 
This goes against our rights. It violates our rights as self-determining peoples. And this money belongs to us anyways. So Canada, you have no right to extort this from us. There is strength and unity, and I think that's what needs to be done. And, and maybe Mr. Atlio should make a statement. So maybe somebody should ask him, what do you think? What are you going to do to help all those bands who don't have the human resources to be able to understand the whole how many page agreement? How are you going to support them as, as a so-called advocate for First Nations in this country? So, yeah, I'd just like to say that what uh, Harper is playing is uh, he who pays the piper calls the tune. And that's what he's saying to Indian bands across this country. Because for those people who don't, who don't know what a contribution agreement, that's the agreement that the Department of Indian Affairs signs with uh, the different Indian bands every year, like our Indian Reserve, Nisqanlath, gets about around 6.5 million uh, a year, 7 million a year, and it's under a contribution agreement. And uh, we've always been susceptible to political pressure by the government when, when we accept those monies under the auspices of these contribution agreements under the Department of Indian Affairs under Section 9124. I think what we need to do is reverse the tables on, on, on the government because actually the government owes us more money than, the, than they sort of contribute through these contribution agreements. And, and uh, what they're trying to say is that through these agreements, what they're trying to do is get transparency and accountability for from Indigenous people um, and try to say that we're kind of crooks and we're, we're misspending so-called taxpayers' dollars. But I totally disagree with that. One of the things that you need to understand, um, this very this afternoon I was talking about this argument where we uh, went before the WTO in a Canada softwood lumber dispute and we argued that Canada's policies of not recognizing Aboriginal treaty rights as a subsidy to uh, the Canadian forest industry and the WTO and NAFTA accepted those submissions which basically mean we have an interest in all lands and resources and if you understand like the province of British Columbia, for instance, for all those people that are negotiating under the British Columbia treaty process or running into this $500 million debt that Russ raised earlier. In British Columbia, for instance, the British Columbia government since 1998, after Delgamo, have had to report in their financial statements how they're uh, dealing with uh, their liability for Aboriginal uh, land claims in British Columbia. And it's in every financial statement, you know, where they do the accounting, uh, they put set out the assets, the liabilities, they subtract, they come up with the benefits of the problems that under there they have a contingent liability. And in the contingent liabilities, they deal with Aboriginal claims in which they basically are saying that the way we're dealing with it is we're dealing with it through the federal comprehensive land claims policy. We're basically going to extinguish all the Indian people's rights. Therefore, we're going to own the province again. That's what they're saying. But every province in this country should be doing the same thing. But the people who you should complain to isn't the government themselves. I know a lot of our Indian chiefs will go and tell Harper about uh, or the Mulroney or Trudeau that they're stealing our land. And you know, obviously they're laughing because they are stealing our land and we're telling the thief that he's stealing our land. You know, it can't be more funnier than, <laughs> than Bozo the Clown <laughs> doing that. <Yeah. laughs> the people who you're supposed to be telling this to the standard and poor is you're supposed to be telling it to the credit rating agencies. Because what those credit rating agencies are doing is giving Canada a AAA credit rating, or the province of British Columbia, a AAA credit rating, based upon the fact that they control economically our Aboriginal and treaty territories. That's what they're saying. 
And you know, indigenous people need to realize that you need to go tell the proper people. Because see, the credit rating agencies are telling investors who buy Canada savings bonds, or BC savings bonds, that Canada is managing its liability to all the people who they owe you know, resources to, and they're managing it properly, but they're not. The biggest risk in this country for this government and all governments is their liability to indigenous people for not recognizing our Aboriginal and treaty rights. And if, and if you go to the credit rating agencies and you tell them, because they, they just have an office down here on Bay and uh, Bay and uh, whatever, Bay Street down here, you tell them that they're not accounting properly and they'll get nervous because uh, what do you call that movie, Inside Job, or whatever that movie was, they were being accused of not telling investors before the 2008. And so they're nervous. So they have to tell on Canada, and they're the guys that took down the credit rating agency of the United States, you know? And so you need to understand that there are other tools that you can use to deal with financial accountability, and then you can just throw out this damn contribution agreement, because we shouldn't be getting money under uh, Section 9124 as a contribution agreement, like a welfare recipient that has to sign on a dotted line simply because the, the government wants to make you. No, we should be getting our resources because of recognition and affirmation of our Aboriginal treaty rights under Section 35, and we should be deciding. <laughs> to a meeting on Wall Street um, at Standard & Poor's um, with the guy whose job it was to issue Canada's credit rating. I mean, this is what Art does. He's incredible. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, got the meeting and, and, and brought all the documents, all the court cases, you know, all the writs, and, and presented it to this guy and said, you know, Canada is not AAA. Canada <laughs> is carrying these debts and they're unacknowledged. And to me, it was one of the most uh, enlightening moments of my, my life, being in this, you know, what were we, like the 44th floor of some terrifying tower. They almost didn't like the Jow in, they didn't have his passport with him. And um, it was, yeah, not that long after 9-11. And, um, and he heard them out. I was just listening. And, and he nodded, and he said, we know. We follow this. We don't. We don't think. It, we. We. I mean, I forget exactly how we put it, but he said we don't think it's a risk. He didn't argue on any of the points. Wow. Basically, what he was saying is, you you have the law on your side, but you don't have the power. Huh. Right. And so that to me is very important for us to understand. You know, this is about. I don't know more what the next phase of this movement is. And, and you know, I, when I think about that, you know, I think the next phase has to be doing things that let that guy know that not only do you have the law on your side, but you also have the power. And I think that the power to actually implement those things. And, and I think that that's, that's where these kinds of coalitions um, become very, very important. I'm sure they paid attention to I Don't Know More um, at, at Standard and Poor's. They certainly are paying attention to the to what's going on with Northern Gateway and all of this stuff that we're doing around the tar sands. It's creating investor uncertainty, right? I mean, if you are VP and you're contemplating a multi-billion dollar investment in the tar sands and you're not sure you can get the oil out, your, your, your shareholders are going to ask you, is that a smart thing to do? You know, Alberta's landlocked. They've got to get it out somehow. So I think on multiple fronts, it, it, you know, the, the, the issue is um, exactly what, what Art is talking about, heightening that uncertainty, because that, there's a, a lot of power in that. Um, 
Yeah, the yeah, thing I wanted to add in reaction to, to Chelsea is just maybe to keep in mind as we think about what kind of coalitions we can build, that the Harper government is attacking everyone who stands in its way, everybody who steps out of line, using money as a weapon, okay? It's, it, yes, of course, First Nations are on the front line of this because First Nations represent the biggest obstacle to the extractivist agenda because the resources are on their land, um, overwhelmingly. But environment, uh, environmental organizations are also being attacked, being threatened with all kinds of audits, being told they're foreign terrorists, all the foreign agents, whatever. Um, and you know what we just saw in the budget this week with CETA being folded into the Department of Foreign Affairs and essentially um, telling the foreign NGOs that they better just be adjuncts to the extractive industries, essentially just the PR wings, and don't step out of line. And you know, the first people who got this from the Harper government were the NGOs that were working on Palestinian rights. I don't know if people you know, remember that wave of funding cuts, but basically they said you know, anybody who is supporting Palestinian rights is not going to be getting money. And that sort of chill, that chill went out. And it affects the CBC. You think the CBC isn't terrified of getting their funding cut? Um, so we have all this fear throughout the culture. And I think really First Nations are the only ones who are really standing up to that fear. Most people are just going quiet. Um, so I think we need to figure out a way to um, draw out these common threads and spread the courage around. Uh, because then I think we might actually get rid of um, these Wonderful people. <laughs> <laughs>
and, and, and how do we guide ourselves with these foundational principles? So what does the relationship look like? To me, it looks like us speaking our languages, okay? Even if we're not fluent, I'm not fluent. I'm learning, I, I still have to do that. And it's like the process of decolonization, it's a lifelong thing. It, it looks like language being shared, and it looks like um, going back to those principles of peaceful coexistence and non-interference. Now, that's a lot of aspirational stuff, and people are going there, but yeah. Okay, what do you look like on the ground? First things first, we need more land. And that's, that's a simple fact of it, and I've heard it a lot today. And this is something we have to go back to. South of the 60th parallel, okay? South of 60, uh, First Nations have 0.1% of all the land in Canada. That's a pittance. It's nothing. It's ridiculous. We can't support ourselves on that land. So there needs to be a redistribution of land and resources. And I know that that scares a lot of people because it sounds like a balkanization. Oh no, we're going to have these tiny little First Nations cities all over the place. Okay, but that's not what we're looking at. We're not talking about um, communities of 200 million people. Um, becoming sovereign nations and, and you know, having their own passports and everything like that. Uh, unless some of them want to do that. Um, but we have, we have nations. We have nations with many communities in them. And we have shared territories. And what I would really like to see is for our people to stop asking permission to exercise their apparent rights. Um, <laughs> and what really inspires me is when I see this happening, when I see people asserting their rights, this is what you make um, they went and they made their own fisheries law, and they've been running one of the most successful fisheries in the country. Okay? They didn't have to do that. They just did it. And um, earlier today, we saw Erin talking about how the Haudenosaunee are taking things into their own hands, and they're saying, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna guide this process, and we're gonna do it in a principled way that 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 follows our traditions and our laws. And if you want to have a relationship with us, you're gonna have to respect that." And it's a scary thing to do. Um, but I think that when we go back to our language, when we go back to our land, when we understand those principles, those things come out. We understand our relationship with the land. Let's, for example, um, let's take back jurisdiction over the environment. <laughs> okay? Because Canada is doing a crap job. <laughs> so let's take it back. And, and this is not, um, I'm not talking about violence. Okay? I'm talking about love. We're, we're not out there. Thirty things down. <laughs> We're out there protecting what sustains us. We're out there with our families, our elders, our youth, and we're not wanting to put them in danger. This is not about violence. This is not about violence. And so, I want to see more Canadians joining with us in that because all of us have um, have a responsibility to protect the land because it's what sustains us. Whether we live in the city or or, or we're rural, okay, we can't get away from that. So I see a lot of changes. I see a land distribution. I see us not asking for permission. Okay? And I see Canadians trying to learn more about us for once and not, not having all the concepts translated constantly into non uncompatible Eurocentric concepts. Thank you. Decolonizing amongst ourselves and taking, bringing back and restoring those relationships we have amongst ourselves because we cannot have a peaceful coexistence with Canadians if we don't have a, a peaceful coexistence amongst ourselves. The historical knowledge that has that is there and waiting to be swept up by the minds of young and the minds of old um, is really important to bring into. Canadian society and our society. Many of our youth don't even know what really happened in the Indian residential school system. They don't know about the loss of language. They don't know why, you know, so many children are into the child welfare system. And, and really what we need to have is the restoration of those institutions. So my health is dependent on my ability to pick medicines and my ability to be able to go into either a sweat lodge 
or my ability to be able to sit under the stars unmolested. I look around me and, and, and I see the parts of my traditional territory where we are being visibly erased from. And so we need to bring back those physical markers that say this is our land. It's not just about saying this is our land. Because when, when people come here from other countries, they say, where are the Indians? Right? There's nothing, there's nothing in this university, there's nothing in Toronto, there's nothing in every major city that tells you of the first peoples whose territory those cities are built on. And so we need to get back some of those, those changes in, in society because I'm tired of always having to fight to keep my language, to fight to keep the, the, the culture that my ancestors fought so hard for. I'm tired of that. I would, I would just love not to have to worry about that. Just for one day, one moment in my life where I know that, my, that the art and the music and, and the songs that, that, that we hear in ceremony, that the things we use to, to respect the land and to make sure that the next year's harvest will be just as bountiful as this, this year, that the things that make us Okwamua people are nurtured, that we don't have to have this kind of, let's get funding for this and, and project money for that. Because that's what we're doing as indigenous people here. We are always fighting to keep what's left of our culture, of our identity. And so peaceful coexistence to me means Canadians recognize that their country is based upon the oppression of indigenous people and you do something about it. Not just, not just find ways. Not just find ways to get us the money, but, but you know, cherish the indigenous people that are on this planet. Because what we have, that, that diversity, enriches Canadian society. It enriches the global society. And it is dangerous for us to assert our sovereignty. It is dangerous. We don't have that luxury of saying, this is our land, we're going to go protect it from the loggers or from the miners. When we go out and we do blockades, we do so knowing that it's a threat to our safety. And I would I dream of that day where people don't have to do that anymore. That we live in a society that loves us, that respects us, and cherishes who we are as human beings. And to me, that means major changes in the relationship, a major change in attitude, getting rid of colonization, and the assimilation policies that we are forced to live under every single freaking second of our lives. I am tired of I just want to say that this has been an amazing day. Um, I, I've been so inspired by so many speakers, um, and I'm so grateful uh, to the organizers for having created this space. Um, we need more spaces like this. Exactly um, what Ellen and Chelsea have just been talking about, where we can where we can learn together, um, where we can where we can learn a, another history and tell a new kind of story. Um, I think on a practical level, one of the things that I, I, I hope to see in you know in the, in the next coming months, we heard that the previous panel was talking about the plans for defenders of, of the land and Island War coming together. Uh, there's probably going to be some direct action this summer, this spring, um, and uh, representing Canada um, in this discussion. I would like to say that um, we need to be very aware of precisely the, the types of risks that Ellen is talking about and do what we can to share those risks. Um, and some of that will mean people going out on the land, and some of that will mean people doing jail solidarity and media work here in Toronto, and linking up with, um, with, 
with people who are already doing that type of solidarity work. Uh, Sherry Pasternak was talking about different organizations that people can plug into doing solidarity with Barrier Lake and communities. So we need to do that homework. Link in. There's already an existing infrastructure. Um, this, these ideas were not just invented. Um, the hope is that it can get a lot bigger and a lot stronger um, in, in the near future. I think we are at a really pivotal moment. Um, maybe it always feels that way, but you know, it, 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 uh, I think it was Sheila um, earlier talking about the story that Canadians tell themselves about Canadian goodness um, and multiculturalism and, and all the wonderful things that we lie to ourselves about. And, and, and what a barrier that's been uh, to real solidarity. And I think if we can thank Harper for anything, it's that he's taken the mask off Canada for a lot of people. And I think it's getting harder and harder for non-natives to tell themselves that story about Canada. Maybe they're romanticizing another era, but at least they know that now this government cannot be trusted. And I think one of the big mistakes that non-natives have um, made is delegating our side of the treaty relationship to the experts. Um, and part of it has to do with the complexity that Chelsea was talking about, that language. It's very arcane, it's arcane to everybody. Um, and it's shut out the vast majority of people from the discussion. Um, and that's been part of what has allowed that delegation to, to, to take place. We'll leave it to the experts, they're negotiating in a hotel somewhere, or they'll come out when they're done. When you're dealing with the Harper government, I think everybody knows they cannot be trusted. There is no good faith that you can project onto this government. So I think this combination of the unmasking of Canada um, and, uh, and, 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 and the inability to project goodwill onto the negotiations um, means that there is a moment now where a new, a, another story can be told uh, about what this country is. And it's going to have a lot of pain in it, but I think that it also is our only hope. <laughs> um, and, and by our, I mean everybody, because our civilizational story about our ability to dominate nature and about the infiniteness of the natural world is crashing all around us. We, and here I'm talking in the settler, we, we don't have another story to replace that. So we know our old stories don't work. But we, we are afraid of the implications of that because we don't, you know, pe people are terrified of being stories, understandably. We are people of stories. So that, that, that process that, that this room represents, that I don't know more has opened up, it, that is why it's so exciting because we now have a space. We now have the potential uh, to realize that it's not the end of the world. It's the end of this world, and another world is opening up. Thank you. Yeah, I think one of the uh, things that I would like to see in terms of, of a new relationship is that indigenous people uh, be uh, recognized as being responsible for Mother Earth. You know, I think one of the things that uh, is clear in the, the Harper, the conservative-based government, is that through this Amana, Amana bus bill, he's pulling out uh, of uh, protecting the environment through basically saying, in order to implement his economic goals, they can't afford to protect the environment. And uh, I think that's, that's, that's the wrong direction for, for any uh, government to go. But because the federal government is, is, is pulling out of uh, protecting the environment, it leaves a vacancy that indigenous people can say, we will fill uh, under protecting uh, you know, our uh, aboriginal and treaty rights. You know? that there is a strong basis where we fill the vacancies created. And I'm saying this in a constitutional sense, that if the 91 and 92 governments, the 
federal provincial governments are going to fail in protecting the salmon in terms of protecting the air or protecting the trees uh, and they're going to pull back and they're doing that they're, 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 they're cutting back on programs and services in that direction indigenous people should say that's our responsibility then you pull out we pull in and that's that's the way it happens and i think that's the direction we should be going and i think meetings and discussions like that in, in toronto is very important you know i'm from british columbia and one thing is that i know government is made in ontario <coughs> or quebec one of the two you know by the time the they quit counting votes at the Manitoba border. You know, we could literally elect the rhinoceros party in BC. It wouldn't make a hell of a lot of difference. Probably would do a hell of a lot better than the party. But the thing is that Toronto is, is, is very significant in, in terms of getting this message across to government, you know, and let government know that uh, that this is a serious alternative. And we could, and indigenous people can make those arguments, you know, and, you, and we've seen where the courts have backed us up, like in the Haida case, for instance. The Haida case was based upon Gujao and the Haida Nation wanting to protect the last of the, the 20% of the last old growth forest, you know, and that's what the Supreme Court backed up. So all these environmental cases, serious ones are actually these, these title of rights cases that actually emerge from those kinds of discussions. So I'm not talking uh, pie in the sky, you know. We're talking about some very serious issues here, but what you need is the political will. And you're not going to get that political will from Harper. The only way you're going to get that political will is by Indigenous people and Canadians working together to kind of solve that. And it's through frontline actions, I think, that you can get that kind of dialogue. So I would encourage that we keep pushing uh, for those kinds of actions and supporting people, indigenous people across this country that are struggling to protect their land against the destruction, especially by pipelines and mining companies and tar sands and stuff like that. To keep the strength up, I think that's the direction that will produce a better future for our, our, our children in, in, in the future. Thank you. Before we go to the next question, I just want to throw another two bits in. And uh, it's just that what Ellen was saying about, um, you know, having a good relationship, it reminded me of, um, I was reading that uh, Bill Erasmus, was it the Dene Chiefs? Uh, he went to a tourism uh, summit symposium in Berlin and uh, was selling, you know, where they were selling Canada as Canada the Beautiful. And he exposed them as not being truthful. And what Canada has in its beauty and its land. And, you know, he wrote a beautiful letter. But it reminded me too of when I was in Hawaii and I was watching the news and all the children learn Hawaiian. Even the non-native children learn Hawaiian. Yeah. And the government, in, it, it encourages the people to just support you know, Hawaiian culture because it's important to their tourism industry. Yeah. You know? And so why don't we get off this boom and bust cycle and realize that we have a treasure that is quickly disappearing from around the world, natural beauty, and embrace it, and embrace the people who understand that beauty the most. You know, where we can speak our languages and have all our neighbors speak our language. You know, and it, it, it is possible, it just takes a change of mindset. So I just wanted to throw that in too. <laughs> I think we're going to take a few more questions from online in the audience, but I just want to thank everyone and everybody um, stay and <laughs> thank you so much, Naomi, for joining us.
questions from the audience. There was there was one from Facebook, and uh, it's Indigenous people in the South are shifting the balance of power in many ways and are having an impact internationally. What can we learn from what the Indigenous people in Latin America are doing? So, would you like to start, Ellen? Or Okay. Oh yes, and also uh, before everybody leaves, we're going to have a donation jar that will be going around. So um, please uh, feel free to be generous. <laughs> but uh, so we're going to go to Chelsea now. Chelsea, did you hear the question? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. Well, there's there's a real diversity of things that are happening in Latin America. We're talking about huge areas and, and so many different indigenous nations. So um, I guess we need to narrow down who we're talking about. There's, a, 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 for example, we've seen in Bolivia for the first time, you know, you've got a majority a country of, of indigenous people who only recently um, have had an elected representative that was indigenous. And they've enacted um, a constitution that respects the environment. And I think this is really important because it's, if you look at the way that they set it up, they've actually got it so that there are advocates of the environment who speak on behalf of, of the earth. Whenever there's any sort of development proposed, anything has, that all has to take into account um, the impact on, on the earth. That is absolutely something we could do here. Okay, we, we have the tools, <laughs> okay? Um, we even, I, I think it even works within the Canadian system in a limited way. Um, so there, this is not beyond the realm of possibility. This is not some backward third world nation. This is very sophisticated constitution writing um, that uses, that is founded in indigenous principles. So it's something I'd like to see here. Um, now, if you if you look at what other nations are doing, um, they're facing a lot of violence and they're they're trying very very hard to protect their land. Canadian companies are implicated in some of the, the things that are going on right now in Guatemala and elsewhere, um, where people are being murdered, or being forced out of their villages, so that uh, those lands can be opened up. Okay? Um, I think it's really important that we stand in solidarity with those nations. Um, I think that the Canadians know what their what their resource companies are doing in other countries as well as in Canada. Okay. Uh, so what we learned from that is basically, if, if nobody knows that this stuff is going on, then people are going to die. And that's not just in Latin America, that's happening here too. You look at all the murdered missing women, you look at all of the, the kinds of things that we're facing, the poverty, the suicide, okay, the, the poor health outcomes, when people don't know about it, it, it's worse. Because nobody cares, nobody does anything. So getting, um, shining a spotlight on these things, which is becoming more possible through social media in Latin America and Canada is super, super important. Next thing. Great, thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> Ellen and Art thought you did an excellent job answering that question, so they're willing to go straight to the questions on the floor. So. Like the, the boats going off the coast. 
Like, I think we need to be able to picture what that looks like, to, to draft those natural laws into a constitution and language that can then hold others accountable, again, you know, for like Enbridge. No, it's illegal for Enbridge to be here. I think we just need to be able to picture it to eradicate the fear because the, the people can't picture an alternate, the indigenous alternate, right? So I think we need to draw the picture. So I'm asking the panelists, if you could draw a picture of an indigenous economy, what would that look like internationally? Because we already, we, we did that for centuries, but today. I think one of the, the things that uh, definitely you, you uh, go back to would be the uh, traditional basis of, of indigenous law. Uh, I think when you recognize uh, the aboriginal title, a clear aspect of that is an indigenous law, and to a certain extent, you hear uh, right away that the problem is with regard to pipelines is the, the devastation that it will cause if there is a, and there will be some form of oil uh, leakage. People talk about, you know, uh, any kind of, there's really no real way of repairing the damage that once you have the leak, the kind of destruction is happening. And some people were talking about the boats that go um, from your area up there where they would have to do a right angle turn. You know, there's no question in the minds of the people there that sooner or later one of those boats are actually going to ram the, the ground and then you're going to have leakage that's going to destroy a whole area. It's a question of prioritizing, you know, indigenous-based laws in relationship to that. And there's logic behind it. You know, uh, who said that, oh, gee, it was just simply because this company has a mining permit and they, they're going to be losing, you know, $30 billion that all of a sudden they should be the priority over, you know, the salmon and the fish, you know, there's no, you know, that's the kind of spin the popular media puts on, that's the kind of spin that a lot of us accept, but if you really sit down and, 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 and talk logically through, you know, what is the Harper, you know, priority list value system in relationship to, to uh, you know, extracting or transporting these dangerous products, you wouldn't agree with his list, you know, and that's one of the things that indigenous people have to be able to make very clear, not only to um, the um, government, but to the insurance companies that actually insure these, the, the, these, uh, these um, um, pipeline companies that what mitigating plans have Enbridge really done. You know, they talk, grandiose plans about, oh, if there was a leak, we would be there within, you know, within a day or two, you know. Really, you know, that's not true, you know. Like, how much are they really going to put on the table up front in terms of turning over to indigenous people, you know, enough to actually do something like that would be in the billions. It would even make some of these projects prohibitive in the sense that it'll cost them too damn much money, you know? So the thing is that those are the kinds of questions that, that, that we need to have a discussion about that more, but I, I like that, I like what you raised, you know, like how would it look? I think, yeah, we do need to keep dialoguing on, on this topic. Okay, we're running out of time, so it's up in, we wanna have, Another question for other people, or do you want to hear from Chelsea about that? Let's see. Let's hear from Chelsea. Okay, let's hear from Chelsea. Okay, I'll, I'll be brief on that one. Um, it's a myth that all Native people are totally opposed to development, <laughs> okay? Um, I think that it's really important that we understand because of the diversity of nations that we have, everybody's going to deal with it, the, the issue of, you know, what, what's the economy going to look like in different ways. And I think most people can agree that development's okay, it's done sustainably. And the people who actually have to live with the consequences of the development in a specific region, be they native or non-native, 
have the very high stake in making sure that that development is sustainable. But the people making the choices right now don't live in those areas. They're not the ones who are, who are directly being impacted by that. When you take that factor away, when you have those decisions not made by people you know, thousands of kilometers away, when it's made by the people living in a territory, native and non-native, then the choices that they make are more likely going to be sustainable. And that's still going to be an economy, but it's not going to be the kind of economy we see right now, which has no um, care at all for the environmental impact. Money is everything, and human beings don't even matter, okay? So what is it going to look like? It's going to look like a lot of different things, but when those choices are made by people living in the territory, it's going to be a lot, uh, it's going to be a lot safer, and it's going to work better for those people. That's my hope. Okay, we're going to go to another question from the floor now.